Hello and welcome back to DC to Daylight. My name is Derek, and in the last couple of videos we were focused mainly on antenna theory, and some design considerations for a simple dipole which had an omnidirectional radiation pattern. Theoretically that allows us to talk to folks within a certain radius around our location. This time we're going to make an antenna with an additional what's called parasitic element, and this will help push that RF energy over to one side which will provide us some directivity. However, instead of using UHF, which requires a very small footprint, we're going to shoot for a lower operating frequency in the HF band around 28 megahertz. This will increase our antenna size dramatically, but we should be able to utilize the ionosphere to bounce our signal across the pond and talk to different countries. Calling CQ, CQ, CQ. Anyone, anywhere, CQ, CQ. So let's get right into building a long range directional HF antenna. So let's go over what we want to accomplish today. Basically, I would like to set the goal of using my amateur radio transceiver, aka ham radio, to try and communicate with someone in a different country, preferably over the Atlantic Ocean. I'll go ahead and say it, the earth ain't flat, and we can't use line of sight communication over these very long distances because the old earth gets in the way. So we're going to bounce a signal off of the ionosphere, and if the conditions are right, we should be able to hit Africa or Europe, maybe even farther. If you're new to all of this, the ionosphere is a multi-layered region of our atmosphere which is composed of electrons and electrically charged molecules energized by solar radiation. The fun thing about the ionosphere is that we can fire off RF radiation at it and it gets refracted back down to Earth. At a low enough what's called takeoff angle, we can bounce a signal thousands of miles away. The lowest layer of the ionosphere is the D region. This is between 37 to about 57 miles above the Earth. This layer is energized by sunlight, so exists primarily during the daytime. It pretty much absorbs RF, so isn't of much use uh, with this project we're doing today. The E region extends from about 60 to 70 miles above the Earth. Ionization is caused primarily by extreme UV and X-rays, so peak ionization is during the daytime, and exists somewhat throughout the night. The F region is the outermost ionized layer and can range from 100 to 300 miles above the Earth. It's the most usable region to us in that it hangs around in both day and night. And during the nighttime it exists as a single layer, however it splits into two layers during the day. The solar cycle, time of year, sunspot activity, and other things affect how active the ionosphere is. Right now we're on the upside of an 11 year sunspot cycle. That means right now is the best time to get into amateur radio. So at lower frequencies the E and F layer tend to refract RF back down to earth. And the maximum usable frequency or MUF or MUF as it is commonly referred to tells us roughly what frequencies begin to penetrate right through and go into outer space instead of coming back down. There's actually a map where we can get this information from. I'll put this link down uh, below and you can play around with it yourself. So if you recall last time we had a vertically polarized dipole. This time we're going to use a horizontal dipole and that's typically what's used in the HF uh, bands. So this gives us some uh, directionality right off the bat whereas the uh, vertical dipole does not. So Let's just look at the 3D far field plot. I'm gonna say 28.5 because that's about where I designed this antenna for. This is a 10 meter wavelength. We wanna be half a wavelength above ground, so we set it to five meters. Let's hit start. And you can see our resistive component and our reactive component of that antenna. But anyway, let's look at the far field plot. That won't affect us. And this is the typical pattern for a regular horizontal dipole. We propagate our RF in both that plus and minus y direction. Now if I want to look at the slices of that, I can do this and let me actually turn on the azimuth and that'll tell me the radiation angle that we're shooting most of that energy off at. It's between 25 and 30 degrees. Okay, let's say 25 degrees for elevation angle and that's pretty common. The lower we are, the better we are for super long range communications at bouncing off the ionosphere. Uh, we're a little high and that's you know to be expected. Now how can we push that energy off in one direction? Let's now go to another file that I created which is the two element Yagi antenna. So this is the Yagi Uda antenna. We have a driven horizontal element just like that but we have a reflector here that's typically about five percent longer than the driven element. There's no wires connected to this, it's just a parasitic element. That element is actually in the near reactive field so that's going to cause some interference and push that RF Okay, in this direction plus y. Okay, we will have some um, in our rear lobe here, but the majority of the energy is going to go this way. So let's see what that far field plot looks like. We're going to hit start, same conditions, far field plot. You can already see we have a lot of gain in this direction. Let's look at the 3D far field. 
And sure enough, we have most of our RF going out. Yep, 25 degrees. Okay, now with this two element Yagi antenna, we can actually fold the driven element backwards and shorten that. And we can fold the reflector forward and shorten that as well. And we can connect this as a physical loop, but we're gonna have some little isolators between the two elements. So it's still a Yagi, but we're gonna fold those things over. So let's see what that looks like. And this antenna is called a Moxon antenna, named after its inventor. These are the actual dimensions that I put in for our antenna that we're gonna to build today. Let's go ahead and calculate the performance of this guy. Uh, resistance 60 ohms, uh, reactive component 7.2 uh, ohms, and then we have an SWR 1.26, so that's pretty good. Same ground conditions, same height above ground. Uh, you can already see we've got more gain in this direction than the regular Yagi. So let's look at the far field plot. And hey, that looks pretty good. Our front to back ratio is a little better, so we have more energy going this direction, less going out the back. Um, and the elevation, should still be at about 25 degrees. So we'll look at the azimuth, and there you go, 25 degrees. So now I made a sketch of the antenna that I wanna build, so let's go ahead and take a look at that real quick before we make it. So here's a little sketch of the antenna that we're gonna to build today. The target frequency was 28.8 megahertz. Yeah, this is the program that I used to come up with the dimensions. It's called moxgen.exe. There are some online calculators that you can use, but uh, they, they've always come out wrong for me and moxgen uh, has always been correct. So like we talked about earlier, our driven element is this guy right here, and our reflector is this one right here. And these are plastic insulators that I just made out of uh, some round rod that I had laying around. This whole thing is tensioned under these fiberglass rods that connect to the hub, and I'll show you how that whole thing goes together. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I had enough length in these tubes, so just did a little Pythagorean theorem, and I came up with about 12 and a half feet from here to here. So now let's go ahead and go put it together. The first thing I needed to do was make the hub. I made it out of Delrin, which is a machinable plastic. So for that, I sent it over to the shop saw. The hub will ultimately mount to a painter's pole so I can get the antenna up high enough. So here, see I'm drilling a pilot hole, followed by a one inch Forstner bit. Then it was on to drill four three quarter inch holes that the fiberglass spreaders would slip into. The holes were just a bit loose, so later on I drilled and tapped some set screws that keep them secured while tensioning the wire. I decided to make the hub a little beefier and mounting method more secure, so I improvised a second mounting block that would be cinched around the mast and make a more rigid connection. Next I cut all the fiberglass spreaders to the correct length and slotted the ends of the larger tubes, which accept a smaller telescoping tube. The slots allow the hose clamp to compress and make a strong friction gripping action, for lack of a better term. Then I needed some way to guide and attach the wires to the spreaders. I decided to epoxy a small section of larger tube to the end of the spreaders. So for these, I drilled a stress relief hole and slotted it using a Dremel abrasive wheel. Here's a shot of the wire that I used, which was 14 AWG stranded copper. The connector you see there is called a Budwig connector, and these things are great for Moxon antennas or simple wire dipoles. After that, I soldered some terminals on the ends of each section of wire. This makes it easy to connect to the insulators, especially out in the field. The last step in the antenna building process was to just put everything together. So here I am attaching the spreaders to the hub, and then after stringing it up, uh, this is the final product. Lastly, I wanted to make a mount for the antenna mast, and there exists um, what are called drive-on masts, or something to that effect, where you actually use the, uh, this L-shaped piece of steel, drive over it, and you stick your antenna mast right into it. Um, so I had some steel plate from another project laying around, and a flagpole mount, so welded the two things together, and there you go, instant drive-on antenna mount. So now that we have this thing completed, we need to get out to the park and give it a try. Whiskey 4, Victor X-Ray Hotel. Whiskey 4, come again, please. That's a Whiskey 4, Victor X-Ray Hotel. A Whiskey 4, Victor X-Ray Hotel. You're 5'9 in Quebec. Excellent. You're about a 5'7 uh, here uh, in Central Florida, um, just outside of Orlando. Name here is Derek, Delta Echo, Romeo Echo, Kilo. QSL, uh, my name is Norm. And I'm um, currently uh, about uh, 30 minutes from the city, downtown Montreal. 
Okay, sounds great. Um, I'm actually uh, in the middle of recording a YouTube video for Element 14. Uh, so I'm testing out an antenna. We're doing some antenna theory, and I'm running a, uh, a two-element, well, I guess it is by definition a, a two-element Moxon antenna. So I'm currently uh, operating in, in a park right now. I was doing some parks on the air, and I decided to uh, take, a, take a little spin on 10 meters and... Um, Currently operating with uh, an FT891 uh, Yesu with uh, its battery operated um, using battery power and an MFJ automatic tuner as well as um, my MPAS antenna. I'm in a park myself. Um, I have not done parks on the air yet, but I uh, thought I'd just come out here instead of sitting at the QTH to come out here and uh, attach the antenna to the truck and see what kind of contact I can make. What I'm doing right now, except I did do some parks on the air. I had about uh, about 50 some odd contacts, and um, currently running a vertical antenna. It's uh, it's on my. Uh, I've got a Honda CRV, so it's on the back of my hatchback. I've got an antenna mount, and I uh, put the vertical up on there with uh, with my coax and everything. Anyways, yeah. So uh, you're coming in pretty strong, you know. It's pretty good. Thanks a lot, Norm. I appreciate it. Uh, I believe it was Victor Echo 2 November Delta Zulu. This is Whiskey 4, Victor X-Ray Hotel. QSL, Whiskey 4, Victor X-Ray Hotel. This is Victor Echo 2 November Delta Zulu, 73s, and all the best. God bless. Thanks for the contact. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Woo! Finally. We didn't get to Europe, but we got to Canada, so there you go. It's hot. Let's get out of here. All right, that's it for this video. I hope you guys got a kick out of this application of antennas. And, uh, you know, we kind of really explored how the wavelength affects the size of the antenna compared to last time. The one mistake that I made was that I used my watch, which has a compass. I just bought it the other day. And uh, I don't know if it was the proximity to my truck, but I thought I was pointing my antenna east. In fact, I was pointing it north, which explains why I was hearing people in Canada and not hearing folks all that well in Europe. Although I did hear some Scottish and Irish stations and one guy in England, um, but they could not hear me. But I think that this video um, displayed what amateur radio kind of is and how you can make your own gear and try to talk to people in different countries and hopefully you don't mess it up like I did. Anyway, if you end up getting your amateur radio license or if you're interested in doing so, I would really love to hear about it down in the link. Please hit me up down there. We can talk more and we can share information a little better than we can down in the comments. However, you can of course leave me a comment. And maybe we can schedule a, what's called a QSO, which is a, a communication between amateur radio operators at a specific time and frequency. That might be kind of fun if you want to talk directly to me there. So anyway, that's it for me. I'll see you next time.